Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, president and editor-in-chief of DevX. This week, we'll be breaking down the big headlines in global development and bringing in some top experts to help us do it. If you want to follow along with the stories we're talking about, check out devx.com and subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Newswire. There's a link in the description. Follow us along on Twitter, and you can see many of the stories we're talking about today. And we'd love to hear what you think. This is This Week in Global Development. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Vice President and Executive Editor at DevX. You're listening to DevX at South by Southwest, our special edition of This Week in Global Development. The annual South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, is known for its eclectic mix of innovators and policymakers. It's a unique place where film stars and artists co-mingle with tech entrepreneurs and social change makers to discover new ideas and spark inspiration. Increasingly, it's also become a hotspot for global development leaders looking to break out of the usual event circuit echo chamber. I'm here at South by to talk with the leaders about ways that technology and innovation can supercharge the sustainable development goals. Listen in for what's next in a range of sectors from food to health to climate and conflict and how these advancements can reach the most vulnerable. In this episode, we'll hear three perspectives on the role of investment, technology, and innovation in building a more equitable future. Hala Hanna is the Executive Director of Solve, an initiative of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that launches open calls and backs innovators working to solve global problems. We'll also hear from Nayada Kumbuli, Head of Investments at the Visa Foundation, the philanthropic arm of Visa on the case for gender lens investing. And Nazanin Ash, CEO of Welcome.us, will discuss how tech has accelerated her team's work to create a safe haven for refugees in the U.S. While each of these leaders focus on different causes, they're all working on new and innovative approaches to serve vulnerable groups. We'll start with Hala Hanna. Well, Hala, thank you so much for joining me today here at South By. So maybe for our audience that's less familiar with MIT Solve, can you talk through how you approach um, you know, incubating innovators in yeah, this space? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I think that there is a there's a gap of four trillion dollars if we're going to achieve the SDGs, and we're either going to find this money somewhere, you know, under the cushions, or we're going to find, you know, we're going to make it cheaper to reach those goals. So we really believe that innovation and finding new voices and new ideas is one key part of doing that. Um, so that's what we do. We find the best and we scale them. We help them scale. And what are some of the, you know, challenges that the entrepreneurs or innovators that you work with face in scaling and how are you able to help them overcome them? I would tell you that the barrier to scale from the get-go is always capital. Uh, so we provide non-dilutive capital to our innovators and we also, in, you know, one of our key metrics or the key thing that we're pushing for is more uh, philanthropists uh, providing that kind of capital as well. So we've mobilized to date $70 million to our entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, it runs the gamut, really, you know, because sometimes I also think of the scale in the context of uh, social impact. It's not always about the breadth. It's also about the depth. And if, you know, we have one of our uh, solver is uh, working on educating girls um, in Haiti in their local language. And that's, you know, the audience for that is what it is. But it's so important that it's, it's not so much about the unit economics and it's just about it has to, it's the right thing to do. The good news when we talk about you know, solving all these problems is there's about 10 million social enterprises around the world. And the bad news is that there are 10 million <laughs> social enterprises around the world. And how do you, you know, what are, what's, what, where are the needles in the haystack that are going to make a dent in those problems? Uh, and I think this is where we can be really effective at Solve. Uh, we, have the, we have the reach, we have the platform. Yeah, and then uh, some of the conversations I've had here this week with uh, different philanthropists or foundations talks about you know, not only can they provide capital, which, as you say, is, is really needed, but they also can provide other resources, be it um, you know, connections, uh, opening doors. So how do you all think about being able to support these innovators beyond just the, the capital? 
Yeah, I would very much agree. I mean, change happens at the, at the speed of relationships. Uh, so a big part of what we do is encouraging, you know, it is the network, it is the community. And it's um, our entrepreneurs also find a lot of value, of course, in connecting with each other because they're going through the same thing. Um, and uh, yeah, opening doors, opening wallets, those are the two big ones. The only thing I, I do hear some of our entrepreneurs, especially those that are a little more advanced, who say um, we are, you know, we are over-educated and under-invested in. So I think we just have to be careful about that. How do you partner with some of those, um, you know, very traditional players, particularly in the like global development landscape, to be able to scale some of these innovations? We've actually had really uh, important partnerships with the likes of the World Bank, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, whereby we run open innovation challenges for them, with them. Uh, so we're developing very much the challenge that they're looking to find innovations for, and they typically have already on the other side of the selection, um, you know, the the uh, the services or the you know the help set up so that they can incorporate those innovations in their work on the ground. And um, you talked a little bit about you know, measuring the impact. Could you maybe delve a little further into you know, the methodologies and frameworks you use for measuring the impact of these tech-based interventions? It's about you know, how much money is moving from these entrepreneurs uh, to these types of diverse entrepreneurs on the ground. It's uh, you know, how, good is our, how good is our selection and how good is our program at actually helping scale. Um, and so for, you know, when we, we're very encouraged that there's already $70 million mobilized from our, uh, you know, from the partners that we work with to entrepreneurs, who of course, want to, uh, you know, double this many, many times over. So our survival rate for entrepreneurs over five years is 90% compared to 70% for uh, similar programs. Um, but, uh, you know, we're also looking at the net promoter score, at, uh, you know, how many lives are reached. Our, sol our solvers reach 190 million lives around the world. Um, and we're talking about all the, you know, the typical methods of m m monitoring and evaluation, quantitative and qualitative. Uh, of course, these are all self-reported data. And so we do train, uh, we, you know, we have a few trainings for our solvers to make sure that um, we're helping them select the, you know, the measure correctly. So, you know, AI has taken off in the past year plus. It's, um, I think, part of every conversation I've been <laughs> attended here at South by. So, um, how much are you seeing that, uh, you know, proliferate in the kinds of innovations you're looking at? I know and it's so. Funny. <laughs> you can't be here and not talk about it at every single juncture, and it's the same at MIT. It runs the gamut from, you know, uh, facial recognition for patients with Alzheimer's to um, uh, personalization of health and and uh, learning uh, outcomes. In our own work, we're also looking to see how we can incorporate AI, whether it's uh, to level the playing field of um, applicants submitting an application if they don't speak English or uh, they're not f as familiar with the terms um, and then uh, and then we're looking at how, how it can augment the support program for entrepreneurs as well but one of the thinkings behind how do we uh, you know, for the applications themselves how do we you know how do we make that most um, uh, equitable as much as we can even though they're you know, tech alone is never obviously the solution. Um, but uh, having, uh, you know, what, what we're working on right now is, is a chatbot actually that would help uh, innovators submit the best application they can, explain terms that may not be as familiar, uh, give them examples of, uh, you know, solutions that have been successful at being selected. Um, so really within the solutions that they're already building, what is the best application that can help them, uh, you know, that can show their best? Is there a common profile that tech startups and innovators can look to from you know the many that you've worked with that have been successful what are maybe some you know common ingredients yeah I would maybe keep it very simple to two things. The first one is uh, proximity to the problem. And it doesn't have to be that we are, you know, of course it's the, 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 the most proximate is that we are from the community and we're working with the community. But there also, we do have some solvers who are just so embedded in the problem that they really, really understand the concept and the culture and what would make uh, a solution actually stick. Uh, and that helps on two fronts. It, of course, it helps design a better solution that has a better chance of success, but it also just makes 
the uh, entrepreneurs more gritty because they care so much and they can um, you know, work through the highs and lows um, a little easier. And the other is maybe to bake in uh, the social, you know, the, 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 their concern for impact from the get-go. Um, we have some amazing entrepreneurs that we've invested in. One of them that comes to mind is um, Globy. Uh, she's built a fleet of drones that collects data around the world, to um, that you know, which allows them to uh, see a malaria outbreak before it happens. Uh, you know. Um, uh, a drought before it happens, um, and, it, and you know she works with governments and big um, organizations to um, to prevent. And uh, she's you know she's gone through her um, equity round uh, very successfully, but she's put in her terms everywhere that her data will be used for good, um, and that you know a lot of it is open to the public as well. You know, as we look ahead to 2030 and SDGs, it looks pretty bleak, right? Um, I imagine the people you work with give a lot of hope and inspiration. Um, so maybe you can leave uh, our audience with some of that hope of, of some of the great things that are happening out there, some of the things that are working, um, or what gives you hope in the work that you do. Gosh, it's a, I probably have the best job <laughs> there is out there because it is really uh, just working with our entrepreneurs day in, day out. I think the main thing is that they demand more of technology, and I think so. So should we. Uh, you know, they're putting it at the service of uh, of good and of their community, uh, and of you know uh, tackling those huge issues that they have. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably already working in global development. Or maybe you're thinking about carving out a new path in the social impact space. Regardless, we all need a little help sometimes in our pursuit of a happy, fulfilling, and impactful work life. Whether you're actively searching for a new role or looking for some pointers on how to strike a healthier work-life balance. I'm Justin Sablich, DevX's careers editor, and each Friday in the Career Hub newsletter, I'll bring you inside the minds of leading career coaches and recruiters to help you navigate the next step of your professional journey. You'll also have access to the latest hiring and salary trends and a weekly dose of the best leads from Global Development's largest job board. Visit devx.com slash career hub to subscribe. More than 60% of the entrepreneurs Saab works with are women. Increasingly, organizations are leaning into the opportunity to support women business owners and entrepreneurs. One example is the Visa Foundation, which was at South by Southwest to discuss ways that impact investors can support financial inclusion and women's economic empowerment. Here's my conversation with Nayada Kambuli, Head of Investments at the Visa Foundation. Nayada, thank you so much for joining me today. Can you talk a little bit about Visa Foundation's approach to investing in financial inclusion for women? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Visa Foundation um, core focus is to advance economic mobility for small businesses with a particular focus on women-owned, women-led small businesses, knowing the important role that they play in economies. Small businesses, as we know, certainly create the backbone of economies, hiring um, uh, employees uh, from, um, from the community, giving back to their community. But then more importantly, from a women-owned, women-led business perspective, women tend to reinvest 90% of their revenues and income in their families, in their communities. So you have that win-win between small businesses and their catalytic role in communities, as well as women-owned, women-led small businesses. That is the core focus of the foundation, advancing the growth and resilience of women-owned, women-led small businesses globally. And we do so through both grant capital as well as investment capital. Our goal is that over time, we are aligning 100% of the endowment, the Visa Foundation endowment for impact in order to advance the mission and the goal of uplifting everyone everywhere through the power of financial inclusion for small businesses. And I can share more about our approach as well there. Yeah, yeah, I would love to hear about your approach um, and particularly on the investment side. Um, and you know, what what is Visa looking to get out of that from an investment perspective? And what are some of the you know challenges with that model versus maybe the, the grant approach? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, 
When I joined the Visa Foundation about three and a half years ago as the first head of investments for the foundation, the goal was to really build all our investment activity from scratch. So I started with a blank piece of paper. And I remember when I was talking to the president of the foundation, when I was interviewing for this role as well as the board, I said, well, I'm really, exci like, I'm really excited about this opportunity. However, I'm only taking this position if we are really going to integrate a gender lens in an authentic um, and deliberate manner. And so when I joined, essentially, the, the way that we have built the approach and the operations for the foundation is that we invest in women-led or diverse fund managers across asset classes and geographies then then in turn are investing in women entrepreneurs as well as entrepreneurs from underrepresented backgrounds. We know that there is a massive shift from a capital um, ownership perspective that will ha like will happen in the next couple in the next five to six years with women owning hopefully an, like 30 trillion of capital um, and that will shift how we really think about um, who owns the capital where the capital is allocated and where the cap like, where the capital is benefiting um, communities and other entrepreneurs so again just to, to summarize basically we've been laser focused on investing in women-led funds that invest in women entrepreneurs both from a financial perspective because that has been proven that they are generating really attractive returns and sometimes returns that are higher than their known diverse peers and also benefiting these entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs that have been lacking capital access for decades. And can you talk a little bit about some of the, you know, maybe challenges that you face in the sector, whether they're, you know, regulatory or different market dynamics? social barriers. Um, can you share a little bit about those and maybe how you approach so them? So from where we sit, given that we have deployed um, from, from a total capital perspective, we've uh, committed more than 200 million around this goal. Um, we have certainly have um, we have funds, as I mentioned, women-led funds across geography. So it's kind of like it's, it's, it's neat to see the differences, but also the similarities. Um, a cross-cutting thing from a challenging perspective is this view that these funds are still quite young um, from, a, from a track record perspective. Most of the time, these are first, second time fund managers. Um, they are small, so um, ultimately um, can be like they, they can face challenges as it relates to raising traditional um, financial capital. Um, and sometimes they are perceived as too niche or just impact oriented. So we're really trying to um, to break all of those kind of like biases um, by backing both first time emerging women led funds that fits bullseye with our strategy, but also shifting the dynamics around established players and how they bring in on board women at the senior leadership level, um, how they like how they make sure that from an incentives perspective and ownership of the firm perspective, they are an equal footing and from a decision making perspective. Um, so, so, so I think it's more about sh breaking some of those biases and and making sure that capital is flowing and sometimes even being creative on the underwriting process, knowing that an emerging fund manager looks very different from a firm that has had decades of experience with track record and you can, it can show you how they're doing inter, like against the benchmark. I'd love to hear how you approach and think about partnerships. And you know, at DevX, a lot of our readers come from different vantage points, whether it's with a UN agency or a multilateral development bank or an NGO. Um, so, where do you see yourself fitting in that broader ecosystem and how do you look to potentially bring in other partners to help enable your work? Yeah, we, um, we're big believers that um, uh, of collaboration. Um, no single capital alone can address the large challenges that we're facing globally for the planet and for humanity. Um, we, we work with all those players that you mentioned. We work with NGOs and nonprofit organizations through our grant making, given that they are important players in the local econ like local communities and local economies through our grant making efforts. And then with a lot of the development finance institutions as co-investors in many of the funds that we're investing in. Um, what we have found really powerful is because we have this unique approach of 
of providing both grant capital and investment capital, we are actually bringing different players around the table um, that in the past had not been talking to each other. And that's kind of like where we see our role uh, of really kind of like connecting the dots between the practices of you know like nonprofit organizations, social activists, etc., and some of the larger institutions like the UN or USAID or or, or the, even the White House. We have a partnership with the White House, USAID, Amazon around climate and gender, um, and then on the investment side. The DFIs, the development finance institutions, have been doing this work for decades. What we're really interested in seeing is how can we bring in, as I mentioned, new players. Yeah. Um, oh, I'd love to hear just kind of your future outlook and what do you see are some of the big opportunities for financial inclusion, particularly for, for women. Um, I would say what excites me the most is exactly that topic of how do we make sure that there is intersectionality between financial inclu inclusion and climate change. Um, there is a lot of opportunity. Um, obviously, there's been billions of capital going to advance uh, addressing climate change issues and then the same way as it relates to like addressing some of the financial inclusion barriers bringing those two pools of capital together to me is really important um, and will accelerate the pace of change on both fronts um, the other piece that i'm really excited is the importance of bringing in um, essentially new pools of capital to accelerate uh, some of the pace of change. So as I mentioned, what is the role of corporates? What is the role of um, traditional financial institutions, whether it's pension funds, large financial institutions, et cetera, so that it's not just the, the usual suspects that are de-risking some of these investments. As you mentioned, you know, like we are happy to de-risk from coming in first, from taking um, lower uh, tranches, like you know, we've gone into funds in terms of like being like subordinated capital providers, but we need, De-risking is important, but we need additional pools of capital coming in as well. Are you interested in the intersection of business and social impact? Do you want to know how corporate sustainability, ESG, impact investing, and more can contribute to development finance? My name is Adva Saldinger. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and I've been reporting on these issues for nearly a decade. I'm the author of DevEx Invested, our free weekly newsletter dedicated to development finance. Every Tuesday, we explore how companies, investors, and market mechanisms are reshaping the world of development finance. Visit devex.com slash newsletters and join us on Tuesdays. Like Solve and the Visa Foundation, Welcome.us really leans into cross-sector partnerships as a way to accelerate social impact. Nazanin Ash, CEO of Welcome.us, explains that their model taps into the compassion and capacity of the American people, including the private sector, to welcome refugee newcomers to the United States. Nazanin also builds on some of the same themes as Hala and Nayada when she speaks to the role technology plays in her work. Here's our conversation. So uh, immigration is not just a, a U.S. issue. There is uh, immigration happening all over the world, and migration is expected to become um, even more of a driver with climate crisis. And so what do you think, uh, you, you, before you joined Welcome.us, you were with International Rescue Committee, USAID. Um, State Department. State Department. So what do you think could be learned around this model that could be applied and adopted in other contexts to help resettle and welcome refugees? Oh, it's a super, super interesting question. Um, I, you know, I had the privilege, really the honor, of working, you know, sitting in some of the most influential and high capacity entities um, responding to humanitarian crises. So, as you said, I was at the International Rescue Committee. I consider it, you know, one of the it's one of the biggest and one of the best humanitarian response organizations, both overseas and as a resettlement agency here in the United States. You know, it's at the State Department. My last job at State, I was, um, you know, ultimately 
um, it was it was post Arab Spring. We were starting to see these incredible movements of Syrian refugees to Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey. You know, I was deeply involved in that um, humanitarian uh, humanitarian response. So, and I've seen how our multilateral institutions have responded. Like I've seen what great humanitarian organizations can do, what the U.S. government, the largest humanitarian responder in the world can do, and what our multilateral institutions can do. Um, and I think it's not enough. And I think those entities are constrained by capacity. They're constrained by resources and also innovation. And they're constrained by politics. So if we're relying only on publicly funded systems, we can't anticipate that Congress is going to double or triple or quadruple appropriations for you know the way in which migration trends are scaling upward. You know, a stat I use often is you know the average annual refugee admissions through our government-funded traditional refugee resettlement system has been seventy thousand a year for the last thirty years, and you know that global displacement has more than tripled over that time. And as you said, it's a trend that is going to stay with us as the climate crisis accelerates. So we need way better solutions and they're not gonna come from governments alone. But in terms of your question about what lessons can be applied, I think our systems are way too, I wanna use the word precious. Right? I come to this um, you know, with my own family's experience where my parents came from Iran to be exchange students and they never intended to stay, but the Iranian revolution happened in the last year of my dad's PhD program. And so, and they had me, and so they made an extraordinarily painful decision to stay and completely alter the trajectory of their lives. But my broader point is that they made it. And you know, somewhere in our in many of our histories, we have you know the relative who came with the proverbial hundred dollars or ten dollars or no dollar in their pocket, and they made it. And we have made our refugee systems and our systems of welcoming so precious, so overly regulated, so disempowering of refugees. I think you know, such that that pipeline is so narrow, right? Like refugee resettlement agencies operate under a regulatory environment that dictates like the square footage of the housing that refugees need to have, you know, the household supplies that need to be available, you know, the furniture that needs to be available, the X, the Y, the Z that needs to be available. And, you know, what do newcomer families do? You know what I mean? They live where they can afford, they want to be close to a good school, they want to be able to have a good job, and they're generally self-sufficient within 90 to 180 days. So it doesn't need to be so precious. And so that's kind of what we're tapping into with private sponsorship. We're like, what refugees need most is a friend and a guide in their new community. And Americans can do that. And in many ways, they know how to do it better, you know, than a caseworker because they're more connected. They it's have a building network. That community. It's a community. They have yeah. a social network, right? They can call their friend who's a landlord and be like, "Hey, you know, <laughs> like, I'll vouch for this person," you know. So, I mean, just think about it. Like, five hundred thousand people have arrived through these pathways. Four hundred thousand just in the last year. That is five times the number of the 30-year annual average I shared with you. And that happened in a single year. And so, you know, you mentioned innovation and this tech platform you have, and obviously we're here at South By and everyone is talking about tech innovation. So, um, you know, as you say, resources, government resources can't do it alone, gotta find more efficient ways. How do you see the role of technology and innovation helping to better facilitate flows of migration and refugees? I mean, it's democratizing it in an extraordinary way. I mean, we are, I'll just say out loud, we're, we have an annual operating budget of around $10 million, and we've leveraged $7 billion from American communities of their time and resources. 
So, you know, it, and, and it was technology that enabled that in multiple ways. So, you know, we, I mean, we built a campaign and, you know, sophisticated methods to get the word out and inform and empower people of their ability to sponsor. We built sponsorship hubs online where people could get all the information they needed. It's been visited 3.7 million times. Our sponsorship materials have been downloaded almost 400,000 times, you know? So we just like democratized all this information and help facilitate people. We hosted online webinars in multiple languages. And, you know, the interesting thing is we always thought that the, um, the vast majority of sponsorship would come from diaspora communities, like family, friends, people who knew who they wanted to sponsor. But when we launched the campaign within two weeks, we had 6,000 Americans who said, I want to sponsor, but I don't know how to connect to someone who needs a sponsor. And that's when we partnered with the private sector to build this Welcome Connect platform, which you know serves this, this um, community of Americans who want to sponsor but didn't have a way to connect safely and securely in a way that protected refugee newcomers and protected them, um, but where they could match and, and, um, and you know, contribute what they have to contribute as sponsors. So it was this two-pronged thing where technology made the difference in both ways, right? Like all of our online resources that just helped us reach a mass audience and bring them into this opportunity to welcome as well as you know we've consistently iterated with our private sector partners wherever we had an opportunity to unlock oh there are people who want to you know they want to sponsor people they you know that they want to be connected to refugee newcomers we can solve that problem i'd love to hear about um some of the the stories that you can tell that maybe can you know, I see that you're, like, you're really putting a human face and that human human connection, that yes. community building yes. being so critical. And often discussions around um, refugees and, and people who are immigrating is uh, you know, really um, dehumanizing. Yes. Um, and so, how do you see this playing a role in being able to evolve that rhetoric um, and better enable that? You know, just human-to-human -human connection. I mean, the reason I call welcome.us welcome.us is because I think welcoming transforms the welcomer as much as it transforms the people we're privileged to welcome. And our capacity to do this work is as much about us and what we're willing to give as Americans as it is about, again, the people we're privileged to welcome. And you know, we come at this from the perspective that Americans want to help and that, um, you know, the noise and the toxicity in our American political system is about asking people to have an opinion about immigration. We're never asking someone to have an opinion. Um, we are just asking if they want to help. And everybody has said yes to that. You know, whether it's Lions and Rotary Clubs or, you know, faith groups of every type, you know, evangelical groups, Jewish groups, you know, yeah. Mor every type, you know, yeah. Mormon groups, like, you know, so, um, and like I said, in 11,000 zip codes across all 50 states, like, it's truly every corner of the country, so... Like the dividing line for our sponsors is not defined in terms of like Republicans or Democrats or progressives or whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, it's defined by people who want to help and people who don't. And I haven't encountered the people who don't yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, the stories are amazing. I mean, the Lechterhand family that, um, you know, joined us here at South by Southwest, you know, they've owned a family farm in, um, you know, outside of Unity, Wisconsin, right? So, you know, Bryce Lechterhand jokes, you know, Unity, Wisconsin is a town of 400 and their farm is six miles away from there. <laughs> so, you know, um, and, um, you know, and they've had this family farm and, you know, for over 120 years. And, you know, they saw what was happening on the news and they were struggling for how they could help. And they found us 
and and they were like well we've got extra room on the farm like we could do this and and so they did and the whole town is pitched in to wrap their arms around this family you know the local librarian became their english language tutor like they're you know both parents are working locally the mom now is a teaching assistant the dad in a meat processing plant like the boys are in school and you know there's a we did a story like it's an amazing film it's called one good reason and the interesting thing about the film and, and that we did in partnership with service now cuz they wanted to tell the story of like what their engineers had done like their whole this is what i mean by nobody said no right we go to service now and we're like can you help us you know actually if you really want to go back like we had this partnership with um, we have this partnership with the private sector 40 national companies that sit on our ceo council um, Goldman Sachs was the first company to really get behind the sponsorship initiative. You know, they helped fund our campaign. And then when we had these 6,000 people who wanted to sponsor, we went to Goldman and we were like, do you think there's a way you could help us build a platform? Because, you know, people know Goldman as a bank. But they have actually an extraordinary engineering capacity. And it turns out there was a Ukrainian-American um, engineer and a Russian-American engineer colleagues who had each been resettled to the United States in the 1990s under the Refugee Resettlement Program. And they worked for Goldman, they were Goldman engineers. They saw what was happening with Ukraine. Um, they were seeing you know, Ukrainians trying to find sponsors in unsafe ways, like on Facebook and on the internet. And so at the same time we were asking this question, they were coming to us and saying, could we partner and help do something about this? And then they brought in ServiceNow, and literally at one point, both the head engineers at Goldman and the head engineers at ServiceNow said they had to stop talking about the project because so many engineers were like, I want in, I want in, I want in. And they built this platform for us in six weeks. Wow. So it just speaks to like, you know, you open a door to people to be able to help and they rush right in. All we needed from the US government was to create the policy innovation, open the door for American communities and the American private sector to make their contributions, and they will. They'll rush right through. This has been This Week in Global Development. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe using the link in the description. To get even more coverage and analysis on the most pressing development issues of the day, become a DevX Pro member by going to devx.com membership and signing up. Thank you for listening and see you next week.